So we're back, and we have as our guest, as I trailed at the beginning of this episode, uh, Professor Howard Williams, also known as Archeo Death. Hello, Howard. Hi, Mark. Hi, Andy. Hello, hello. Good to have you. And hello. Hi, uh, good to see you again. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, last night, at very short notice, gone ten p.m., I, I messaged Howard and said, "Do you want to?" Do you want to come and talk about dark tourism with us on Watching Brief? And uh, and Howard said yes. Uh, and despite a couple of false starts, um, he's not getting too annoyed that we're wasting his time just yet. So <laughs> so we'll talk to him while we have him. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but this is this this is actually uh, a serious conversation that, that Andy and I wanted to have last yeah. week um, with regards to the concept of dark tourism, which often uh, touches on anthropological and archaeological sites of interest, uh, historic sites in particular of interest, and often places where people have died, um, either through the, the function of the site or through tragic accidents, such as, for example, at the, at the wreck of the Titanic. Um, this, of course, was prompted by the loss of the Titan submersible from uh, the, uh, the, the submersible uh, put to sea by the company Ocean Gate, um, which was diving to the wreck of the Titanic on the weekend of the, uh, the 18th, 19th of June, and was, over the course of five days, subject to a massive search uh, as it became clear that the submersible had lost contact with the surface. Uh, there were speculation about oxygen running out and whether or not uh, people could be heard banging on the inside of, of the submersible. It was very unfortunate. I'm sure everyone at home knows knows the story that I'm that I'm uh, quickly recounting here. Uh, and then eventually on the Thursday, um, it was confirmed that there had been a uh, an implosion not long after contact was lost with the submarine uh, in that initial weekend, and that all on board had been lost. Uh, in in pursuit of an experience, an experience of, of visiting the wreck of arguably the most famous ship in the world, uh, the Titanic, and I, I couldn't help but think, you know, putting the the the, the tragedy and the drama, uh, and and also the questions about how it was reported to one side to a certain extent, I couldn't help but wonder, is this risk worth it when it comes to going to sites like this? But also as well, are are these sorts of sites just inherently uh, interesting? I mean, I, I suppose. Uh, so, I, well, I'll hand over to you, Howard. Initially, what what, what are your initial thoughts on cool. on sort of sites where actually so called dark history and 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 human often human uh, suffering yes. and misery are are a factor? I think there is a broader uh, fascination with death, mortality, and tragic death, mm. and the stories of those that suffered, those that perished, those that survived, and the Titanic embodies and captures all of that. And all of that is legitimate, uh, understandable, and um, dark tourism is often mischaracterized as simply voyeurism, but it can touch on the lives of family members, uh, of um, those wishing to visit the sites of battles where ancestors participated in some fashion in mm. uh, um, tra tragedies, um, but also, um, you know, sites of genocide and mass death. So there's there's nothing when we're talking about dark tourism. I, I don't like the implication that you sometimes get that there's something inherently dirty or wrong about it. The mm. darkness comes with the subject matter as dark, as in referring to subjects that are serious, but not necessarily that the motives of those visiting should be immediately impugned or questioned. But I don't think a lot of the reaction I saw to this very tragic mm. unfolding of events was anything to do with concern with dark tourism. This was concerned with elite tourism. And this was very much about when elite tourists have so much money, they can stop calling themselves tourists, start calling themselves adventurers mm. and start referring themselves as researchers or even astronauts and other um, scientific labels of people who put their lives in incredible risk, years of training to further the knowledge of, of our universe, of our planet, of our society. And what this is, is, a, is an elite tourist game that's commercialized. Mm. Now, then the flip side is, yes, the, the site itself is a shipwreck. It's a site of mass death. It's a tomb. Uh, and that is not irrelevant. Uh, but but my, my point is, though, that I think a lot of the social media reaction to this and criticism of this wasn't wasn't 
wasn't focused on the fact that they are disturbing a wreck, disturbing a mass grave. Mm. And maybe there has been at various points conversations over, since the wreck of the Titanic over that. But a lot of the focus and I thought I saw the anger and outrage and emotional connection was um, about how this connects to the disparities in our global world between mm. the very small number of privileged people who can characterize their activities and justify their activities and we are mobilized we're forced to care mm. uh, and i think so for me this was less about dark tourism and more about elite tourism and you know the decision made by and let's face it regardless of what the media said governments made decisions to search and rescue for these individuals yes uh, why did they i mean i don't i'm not an expert in these things but why would you even bother if you think they may have died that if they have no capacity of retrieval or you know if anything goes wrong in those perilous circumstances you're you're only searching for the dead mm -hmm. and so the amount of money gone into this re search and rescue it, you know incomparable compared with fishermen or refugees or 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 those any in, in any commercial um um okay. periled you know i think those were the issues that people latched onto on social media mm. that, that, that i think made this more about elite to elite tourism and, and adventuring and what the heck's going on in our society and what this reveals about broader disparities mm. so yeah it, it's a fascinating example of uh disturbing examples of tragic circumstances but i think that's where our conversation ended up going uh, for mm. a lot of my academic uh and uh, broader s political commentary uh um, perspectives i saw mm. on this well and i know andy has some thoughts on that that prospect of rescue at sea don't you yeah i i think in a lot of that commentary uh, particularly on social media. And look, I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember the previous attempt, uh, in, in that case successful, uh, to recover the crew of a submersible called the Pisces Three in the Irish Sea in the mm. 1970s. Mm. Um, it was it was a lot shallower than Titan, and um, but uh, there was exactly the same blanket media coverage pre-social media, obviously, but it was you know the the real world suspense thriller will they will they get rescue the crew before the oxygen runs out so that that trope if you like that media trope uh i think we can explain very easily it it, it, it was a real world disaster thriller mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um now and and that, and and i'm not saying that with any disrespect to the five people that died no um the other thing is there was a major misunderstanding among, uh, among much of the commentariat of the situation under international law. Under international law, if someone is in distress at sea, people, governments, agencies are obligated to attempt to rescue. And as happened off Greece with that refugee trawler that was grossly overloaded and capsized under circumstances that we are yet to fully understand in the same way as we don't yet fully understand what happened to titan mm -hmm. now the difference was that the rescue attempt in of the refugee ship happened after the ship sank when people were in the water and it was over a much more compressed time scale and the rescue attempt really only started when they realized that the ship had sunk and, and people were in the water and in distress and in immediate danger. Mm. Um, it was the, the, the thing about the Titan was that until it became clear that the submersible had imploded and everybody had, had, had died almost probably, you know, almost instantaneously on the Sunday, on the descent. Mm. Until that was proven, the search and rescue had to continue. Yeah. Um, so that that's why, and that's why the US Coast Guard was involved. That's why the um, commercial dive support ships were diverted to the site and so on. It, it was, it, it, it's how it's supposed to work. And they had the time scale. They thought it was surmised there was an outside chance however you know that they could have brought off some sort of at least location if not rescue mm. um so you know that i think you know that while 
there are commonalities and that you've got people in distress at sea uh had you know had the situation with the with the refugees been more drawn out i suspect we'd have had more media coverage it wasn't it had all happened by the time the story broke okay uh, and, and these these are things worth holding in balance in our mind in that sense i suppose uh, when it comes to thinking about the broader social implications of this but just to bring it back i suppose to to the question of of going there and i suppose some of the ethical uh, questions and concerns um for example it is very different to taking a stroll through the through what is now the well, what was sorry and what is now the site of the somme the battle of the somme for example it's very different to uh, to visiting um a castle where maybe an ancestor possibly lived and so on and so forth or even going to graveyards and looking for ancestors named individuals uh not least because one of the things i've never quite understood is i believe at least one but from my understanding possibly up to five or six people now have actually had their remains deposited on the titanic there was one uh, wealthy businessman in particular who had his remains um his ashes put into a, a canister and put on the bridge of the wreck as uh, as an exercise in i don't know i suppose some form of 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 well some some extended version of this notion of tourism this sort of use of the site as a, as a prop uh, in this instance for can one's I, own memorial yeah. um what, can, can i interject can yeah, i interject there mark as well mm. that, that, that it, it's also been reported that um i think about 15 20 years ago um an american couple were actually quote married yes on the bow of the titanic in a submersible doing the you know, cosplaying the jack and rose thing yeah the movie um yeah. from the james cameron film mm. I mean, um I mean that's an important point. Is that this the, this this experience of visiting the wreck of specifically the Titanic rather than other wreck is not only now irrevocably irrevocably a, a a visiting a mass a famous mass shipwreck mass death site you know mm. and tomb but also reliving the experience of a filmic James Cameron epic and yeah. so the adventure mm. is multi layered from the tragedy itself um, other previous investigations the whole romance of 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 underwater exploration but mm. also the film yeah so i think it's all those layers are building up to make this of, of appeal but here we have people with this gloss of re we're doing research as we do it mm. we're you know visiting a site even if they're not taking anything away you know they're going to be looking through a monitor no you know and then people are making the points that they could have probably seen better video by seeing the new 3d digital reconstruction of the wreck you'd probably get a better you know there's an argument about what are these individuals gaining by mm. doing this apart from investing a lot of money a lot of time and putting themselves in a lot of risk now regard now th this conversation wouldn't have happened if they hadn't tragically passed away of course no. but my my point is this is where people were having that broader conversation and sure that the the, the 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 superficial similarities to other kinds of search and rescue are, are you know we you know i, I do ex respect we, we can take or leave but people are seeing this as not about the disrespect for the dead or mm. they're seeing this as about the exorbitant amounts of money invested in elite tourism elite experiential adventuring well I, and can i make a can, go, can go, i go. make a point there actually i, I mean i um i spoke to um maritime archaeologist a maritime archaeologist colleague um after um the uh, the week after this happened um uh, and obviously people in that world live with the risk of going underwater either as divers as technical divers sometimes even in submersibles although as this person pointed out that is very rare because you don't need a man submersible to do a crude submersible to do underwater archaeology in fact it's some what well, it's counterproductive it's it's unnecessarily expensive and complicated you send down an rov which has all the equipment that wasn't on the titan like side scan sonars high um hd cam uh, full arrays of hd cameras lighting arrays manipulator arms it's capable of taking samples and so on none of that was available on the titan no um you had you you, you had a, a it would appear you had basic equipment some of it bought off the shelf and a viewport that you could point your iphone through mm. and take photographs 
Um, and I think when you see that, uh, we'll, we'll link to it below, but there's a very good article uh, by Ben Taub of The New Yorker um, looking at the whole Ocean Gate operation. And um, for example, the three passengers, uh, a British uh, aviation uh, multimillionaire, billionaire, and uh, an Anglo, um, an Anglo Indian multimillionaire, and, and sadly, his twenty-one-year-old, uh, uh, sorry, nineteen-year-old son. Nineteen-year-old, yeah. Um, who, who, who were the? Well, to all intents and purposes, they were passengers, but in pay, paying passengers now, and it's reported that the going rate for a descent to the Titanic on the Titan was was a quarter of a million pounds, although. Stockton Rush, the CEO of the company, who also died, um, was allegedly um, offering large discounts, suggesting that maybe they weren't getting the take up that they wanted to, to finance the operation. But that, um, and certainly that that's being suggested, that's suggested in Taub's article. Hmm. One thing I think, um, when we think about risk and agency and choice and privilege, the other thing that people were obviously talking about is the fact that while an adult in law, a 19 year old was there as part of this experience and a, a family relative of the person who presumably paid mm. unless, you, unless this 19 year old is already a multi-millionaire billionaire or whatever as well so the question is you know we all take family members old i've taken older family members young family members to places where i've had people tell me well, you shouldn't be taking them there you shouldn't be doing that and you know we all make those personal decisions and then i also see people out doing that what the heck are they doing that in a whether it's on the sea or on land or on a mountain and we're all making those personal decisions for ourselves but as social beings with responsibility for others whether mm. it's biological relationships or other kinds of relationships and sometimes we may have encountered moments where this goes wrong but when you're making such an extreme decision you know to 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 do such an activity um where there is no middle ground, as far as I can see. There's very few events. Like going in a rocket and going into the deep sea are two events where if something goes slightly wrong, there's very little wiggle room, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's the point, is I've been in situations where I've got lost with my kids amongst ferns or whatever it may be. And you go, oh, this is a bit embarrassing, but I can see the path. And it's all a bit awkward for 10 minutes, but you get back on the path. And, you know, you learn a lesson and the kids whine a bit. and but no one's traumatized beyond that day hopefully but but you know when you're in situations like that with the slightest error of a footstep or a, a decision you know it, it does that's what captures the the horror of, of it all for people i think so now we have the irony irony that people are going to be going to a wreck if they're going to be more visits a wreck and a, a site of multiple deaths and these these mass death sites are accumulating death deposits of cremains they're mm. accumulating different kinds mm. of inv invest uh, of expedition to take remains away to analyze and just to view it's mm. it's a it's a fascinating and eerie situation uncanny is the word isn't it i think there's an, i think there's another thing to to just add to that though which is that um i i said earlier that um this what you know you didn't need to go down and submersible to do research on the titanic which was the supposed justification um for, 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 the, for the whole Titan operation. Uh, I think the thing that really sticks in the craw, if it's if it's true, is that the three non-submariners on board the Titan were classed as, quote, mission specialists, not tourists, but mission specialists. Um, for legal reasons to try and get around the rules for carrying passengers on underwater craft yeah and that suggest you know th that speaks i think to the motives of the operation um you know uh, and, well, and, and, quite, and 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 and, 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 and there we are i mean quite possibly the motives of the operation but also as well as howard says possibly it feeds the the the, the the sense of the premium experience shall we say um if you're you know i've been a mission specialist and this kind of thing but mm. just, just again just, just you know all of this stuff has been yeah. has been has been discussed and and particularly for example the engineering yeah. quality of the sub is discussed on on other youtube channels to great extent yeah um i suppose uh for for our viewers what 
one of the things that fascinates me, this is why I brought in this notion of the way in which people have even deposited their own, had their own remains deposited for, for other sites at the Titanic site, is to what extent is it okay that historical sites enter into this sort of usage cycle where people uh, do visit for, for various reasons and sometimes go to great lengths to try and get almost like a prestige burial spot. I suppose you could talk about Bronze Age burials surrounding places like Stonehenge. You know, you could um, uh, you know, make, make, make other comparisons. But at the same time, uh, I, is it only this famous because uh, of things like movies and popular culture um i suppose the the, the thing the thing i was that i was gonna um throw howard's way that, that occurred to me actually during the, this this the timeline of this wreck um so this tragedy unfolding was uh the way in which people today go quite happy quite happily go to places like conway castle harlech you know barmaris um sites of of oppression, arguably sites of of focuses and locuses of um, of political friction, maybe even violence, but now actually they're embraced as as icons. I mean, I I grew up thinking that Conway Castle was uh, essentially an icon of where I where I'm from. Um, is is it is it in that sense? Is this way in which the Titanic wreck has morphed into into a, a tourist trap, basically? Sorry, no pun intended there. Oh, so that really wasn't meant to be funny. Um, is that just a natural process? Uh, should we have expected it to happen or not? Because um, I mean, in that sense, I don't think anyone would class Conway Castle as a, as a as a dark tourism I, now, would they? I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in underwater archaeology or anything or marine mm. archaeology at all. So I mean, the, the move back to a landward analogy is is a relief for me. But <laughs> many of these sites are simultaneously some. Every every dark tourism site is somebody's local picnic spot. Yeah, and so, you know you've got to be aware that there's going to be a multi a, a complexity of relationships. Same with whether we're talking about Stonehenge or we're talking about a, a medieval castle ruins. They, these places are inherently uh, uncanny or ambivalent in different ways. I mean, mm. I went to the recent. I did a blog post uh, this year about the recent rehash of Kyanarvon's uh mm. heritage offer as the to, to use the terminology which was blazed across the media and i only i only realized afterwards i got there two weeks before the official opening as a standard tourist visitor and and you know the new access and platform and sculpture and at one level the sculpture is amazing another mm. level it's it's almost gratuitous in the way it treats the space mm. and it it tries to focus on the making of the space and the making mm. of the castle and the, the power and the logistics and the artisanal effort. And that's great. At, at another level, it's utterly pompous elite art that's only appreciable to those that have this shared, I don't know, national sort of sense of what this is all about and mm. why this and you can almost see the decision making i'm not criticizing the artist's skill at making the art but you can almost see the kind of conceited narrow circles in which this 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 multi-million pound delivery took place and a lot of people are just going around going oh it's good i've got a lift i can actually get up there thank you mobility issue yay that's good mm. and other people you can say oh i've got a bit of best sculpture i can climb on or not supposed to climb on it's unclear and then other people are going to go oh this really does make me think about a story um, mm. i don't know my point is yes i think all these sites are gonna have different connotations but you know i think uh with with, with and, and we should be thinking carefully there are analogies here and when a site is a focus of a of, of dark moments in their history um montgomery castle has as one of its key mm. stories at the gatehouse where a murder took place in mm. the records of the castle from the 14th century early 14th century i think yeah, so those are part of the story that tourists can access and gain but i think the thing we're missing perhaps is the issue of pilgrimage and many sites mm. are simultaneously focused on spiritual pilgrimage or a broader sense of cultural mm. connection that we you, know, you go to the site not because you have a you feel the ghosts of the ancestors are there but you or you but because you feel this connects me to a bigger story with the story of national origins the story of of of, of 20th century mm. culture 
we can go to that site and we can think about the toffs that got away, but also the people that perished in the third class. We can think about all those things and it's not, you can't restrict it down. So I think it is inevitable. Um, it is expected. It's something that as heritage practitioners, we should be talking about and engaging with. And it's part of our conversation. But also uh, we have to be aware that if there was a part of Kynarvan Castle's tallest tower that was only accessible um to five people per year at twenty five thousand pounds but there's a one in a hundred chance you might fall off or get eaten by herring gulls or something like that <laughs> then i think there'll be a, a justified conversation about what the heck are you doing caddy why, why are you allowing people to climb to the yeah. top of the flagpole <laughs> you know uh, calling them researchers mm. or architectural historians in the employ of english heritage or mm. no it's not caddy so but and, and allowing them they might get attacked by seagulls distracted and fall off and become a splat on the on the on the, on the pavement you know that's the kind of thing you just think but someone would go oh i think there's a problem here <laughs> you mm. know, we're taking money for something that's needless expensive exclusive and is all about the performance of a particular kind of identity that's very little to do with what you're actually doing and you could have got the same view by flowing up a drone or seeing a seeing some aerial photographs mm. of carnarvon castle that's perhaps not a good analogy but uh, you know, it's, it's so ludicrous an analogy i think it does make the point though doesn't it <laughs> i'd like to contrast that view with uh, what happens, for example, on the Western Front in France and Belgium, oh, yeah. um, which is an area I know well. I've been there, but uh, I, it's an area I've been involved with both personally and professionally. I've, 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 we've taken family holidays there for reasons I'll explain, um, or, or in in that region. Uh, but I've also uh, dug on the Western Front with the Belgian teams in near Ypres. Um and there you have uh, a big swathe of countryside which is pretty much fully accessible and across it are these sites of memorialization and pilgrimage um the most famous being the the menin gate at Ypres, which is currently being restored with the thousands tens of thousands of names of people who have no known grave um and the teepval memorial in in, in in france on the somme uh, which fulfills the same purpose um but you have the the cemeteries, most famously again the Commonwealth War Graves cemeteries, including the largest of the lot, Tynecott, um, but also um, the German cemetery like Langemark. Um, and now a hundred years on, there are places where people go for free, by and large. Okay, there are visitor attractions you pay for, but the cemeteries you can just walk into. Mm. And I. Mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, and sometimes it's for a cultural reason. The Somme is an emblematic thing in British culture. Um, uh, 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 you know, it, it was emblematic before Blackadder goes forth in that final episode when they go over the top. Hmm. Um, but perhaps more so for many people since, because that seemed to strike a nerve, that, that, that TV moment. Um, but, I mean, uh, we went there because... Um, we wanted to take our kids to see the graves of two great uncles, mm. one who uh, uh, one who was killed in 1917 uh, at Saint Quentin, um, and the other who died on the Somme, not on the first day, 16 days in, mm. um, with the um, with the with the West Yorks, Gosh. and. So, you know, uh, we, we've got a photograph of my daughter, who was seven at the time, in front of great uncle John Tomlinson's grave at Sir Number Two Cemetery. That's a family moment. Yes. Um, the j just just up the road, for, uh, just just a couple of rows, rather, from uh, Douglas Gibson, uh, Lieutenant Douglas Gibson of, of, of the Tyneside Scottish, um, is the grave of the Jewish poet, war poet Isaac Rosenberg and people who visit his grave conduct that ritual of leaving a pebble mm. yes mm. um yeah so you know th these things are multi-layered both that they're cultural they're family but they're also cult uh, cultural groups they're um and 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 they're now fully integrated into the local economy as well yeah. and, and well, so we i think we have to be aware of that of, of those sort of facets and sensitive to them and um, we do and, but, and but titanic but titanic as a visitor site isn't integrated into any real economy um you know it's money that's sloshing around and maybe even being used you know as 
for various reasons for you know it, it doesn't it's not there's no local community around titanic that benefits from people arriving there um and in terms of pilgrimage it's interesting so you know howard mentioned pilgrimage you're, you're implying pilgrimage there uh, I recently watched a, a documentary that was filmed in 2020, I believe, uh, which actually was a genuine scientific um, uh, endeavor. There was a there was a, a slight sense of ego. The guy who went down in the submarine was a little bit kind of like, I'm off to see Titanic, you know, that kind of thing and got in. But it was a much more serious endeavor. You could tell from the equipment it wasn't it wasn't Ocean Gate. Um, but one of the one of the sales uh so one of the sales, one of the USPs of the documentary was that they were taking a descendant of Benjamin Guggenheim uh, to this location in order to try and locate the the state rooms that he uh, famously went down in dressed in his best, sipping brandy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the documentary, they, they reckon they found it in the scatter between the two halves of the wreck. They found one of the, the windows that would have been on, on, on his quarters. Um, this descendant was very touched by it he was quite you know he was like oh wow this really brings that mythology to a sort of a grim reality uh, that actually he didn't there, there would have been a point at which the, the the facade of being calm would have would have probably dissipated um especially when the when the wreck came apart uh but obviously he could only make that pilgrimage because he was a descendant of guggenheim he i'm sure the family still has uh, a bank account with some money in it for example uh if, i mean for me interestingly enough some of the more the more poignant acts of remembrance happen on land so back in in ireland for example the, there's a, a a series of acts of remembrance that happen on the anniversary of the sinking of the titanic there's a a really interesting documentary called uh, waking the titanic i think 2012 which follows the the lives and the accounts of people in steerage from Irish communities that were traveling on the Titanic. And you get some really human stories. You get moments of, of weakness, moments of strength. Um, and you get, you get the hope that was, that was being dashed, but you know, but the, the people were basically being encouraged to go to, to America to find a new life and, and to have that sort of that loss uh, in terms of the future that people were hoping for was, was came across in that documentary. So, you know, there are there are for me there are other more powerful ways of of remembering. Um, but at the very least, that twenty twenty uh, uh, expedition did have a serious scientific goal. It was it was monitoring um, the bacteria that's slowly eating away at the, at the wreck uh, and monitoring the, the the progression of that bacteria, so called rusticles forming on the wreck. Uh, but it also, as well, was scanning the wreck. It created a really high high fidelity four uh, K three um, D model of the of especially the bow, as it was in twenty twenty for for comparison purposes in the in the future. Um, but I suppose you know more because obviously we you know, I think both of you are quite and me too we you know, we all quite rightly share the opinion that it's not inherently wrong to want to visit places where tragedy has occurred in the past. But I suppose are there any tips or thoughts or uh or hopes that we might have for 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 the way in which people approach these sites for example well, I yes just, I'm... I'm, well, so, so for example for example i just mentioned off off uh, off call um the the prospect of or the the, the phenomenon of, of influencers taking selfies at concentration camps you know that's not great is it that's an extreme example i know but okay no. so there's the behavior when you visit a site that is dark has dark associations but there's the actual sense of entitlement of going to a site that's dark tourism and who wants to go there and why mm. so you know if you think of other analogies you think of a plane wrecks on a mountainside that to get to them mm. would be incredibly dangerous and what is the aspiration to get to that spot of death and uh, mm. a, a tiktok mutual of mine did a very good interesting reflection on that she lives near a mountain in alaska where a, a tourist you know beautiful you know plane which was there to look at the beautiful landscape crashed into the mountainside and people died and then the you know it but nobody locally there's a memorial in the local cemetery but no one goes on a pilgrimage to the site where the bodies have never been retrieved and where mm. the wreckage is still on the mountainside because that would be a bit messed up mm. in the same way as i live in wales's newest city relexham and um we have the Gre the Gresford mining disaster where 266 souls are entombed over a mile down and out in underneath boris um 
in in the mine that caught fire in mm. 1934 yeah. and those bodies are still there mm. but why would you want to access them it's that that sense of privilege and entitlement to feel you need to go to that spot it's not about a oh i must go to where a relative passed away it's not about that at all so i suppose it's the act of going the, the act of visiting and mm. then what you do when you're there that are mixed up and in more or less um, and, you know no no mass death site is worth another death is the point yeah and mm. the same with you can even extend it to sites that are not you know whether there's anything to see at the top of mount everest other than a trail of death up and down of mountaineers and mm. you know there's questions there that are outside of perhaps sites that we would call archaeological but are really there's so much human debris on mount everest now um that that you know it is a cultural site it's a yeah. site where um you know so extreme sports extreme adventuring these are one set of conversations but then we have the broader as you said the broader set of conversations when you actually go to these sites that are safe accessible and not exclusive what do you do there and how do we behave and of course we can't police it but we can have these conversations about what is appropriate how do we how do you conduct yourself mm. and you know when we're dealing with digital you know communities where your decision based on your faith your gender your age your background of how you behave at a war memorial or at a site of a a, a disaster a, you know a, a flood or a, a, a an earthquake you know, whatever you do at those memorial sites or those those places of death or memorialization you know will will be open to scrutiny and people will comment and criticize and there'll be a conversation as they we talk about when we talk about slanging matches you know but i i think that there are it, it is difficult to understand and countenance the level of anger and outrage at people taking a photograph of themselves visiting a a holocaust uh, site a site of the holocaust a death camp or something like that when we have people actually dying trying to visit sites that are just irresponsible ill-considered and you know excesses of vanity and none of this takes away from our sense of sadness that anyone has lost their life no. and it's not even trying to pass personal judgment on their life decisions which i've seen people do and i think is not is not the point at all it's not well they shouldn't have done that there's always someone now that they're going to go well they shouldn't have got on that train they just should have known it was going to crash or they shouldn't have got on that plane you know well that's why i don't do this no we're not talking about that um we're talking about just that that that, that sort of how do you do things in a careful and responsible and socially responsible manner? I'll give you another example that you um, caused a lot of furore for me on social media is I, a very big Irish influencer, jumped into a Souterrain and said, hey, guys, I'm going in a Souterrain. Yeah. And I did a video saying that's really a bad idea. And then so many people were passionately going to me, oh, we do it all the time in Ireland. And I had a trained archaeologist with me. I said, no trained archaeologist with you is going to stop you from a corbel roof collapsing. Yeah. You know, what's he going to do? Record, record, the record trace. you in real oh, time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously being a bit rhetorical here, but yeah. my point was him doing that privately in his own time off camera is one thing, but no ambulance is going to get there in time. Even yeah. if he's like 10 minutes from the nearest it's a town and five minutes from the nearest cottage you know no ambulance is going to save him if a cardboard roof of a iron age or an early medieval uh, sort of uh souterrain collapses on this dude mm. while he's making a tiktok and my point is i know people do dangerous things all the time it's not about trying to baby people it's about saying you're doing this to an audience of three million followers on a social media app you're sharing your picture on instagram of you know happy days happy days at the at the death camp you know mm. or whatever you're doing mm. then you've got to take some responsibility for how that's going to be received you're part of that conversation mm. you know and so that's you know something which i think we have a right to have a discussion about and be critical of people that behave in these ways is it is it possibly I'm, incident, I'm, it's, it's, I'll, I'll, i will come to you andy in just a second sorry um is yeah. it possibly and incidentally do follow howard on tiktok he's got far more followers than me um <laughs> uh is it possibly an issue of people not connecting in their minds their interaction with sites like this with a broader narrative so people think that they're having a discreet moment even if their discreet moment is one that they're sharing for example via a social media app uh they don't necessarily think that what they do there can possibly have an impact on the the broader meaning and ambience of of the camp for example if we're talking about auschwitz for example um 
Is, I mean, is, is I that think an that's issue? A really good point. I mean, some of it is it. literacy of the creator as well as the audience. Hmm. Like, I never criticize individuals for doing things that are inappropriate unless they're actually damaging um, a, a heritage site or causing harm to the, or potentially putting harm or setting up an example of looting or mm. in which case I do criticize people's behavior, but I don't do this kind of pose of looking at him showing disrespect for not bowing, bowing his head by the right level of mm. millimeters or look, look at how that, because often you're, you're intervening into that private space and people need to be aware of that. People are sharing things that may have been intended for granny um, and for, for an aunt and a girlfriend and suddenly there's there's some rando professor or ra yeah. random you know, from the other side of the world commenting on how close they got to a, a particular piece of hieroglyph mm. so I, I i think uh you know we've got to have a bit of a bit maturity and balance here realize that you know if someone is visiting a site it may cost them a lot of money not a lot of time it may be and, and they can't people can't constantly hold all of the cultural and historical knowledge of a site so if i i haven't actually been but if i go to the Teepval or men on gate. I'm sure most of the time it won't even sink in till days later because I'm that kind of guy. I'll just waltz around, take my pictures, and not think, oh, yeah, there were some other people there. And if someone put a picture of, look at this professor, all he's done coming here, he's standing around taking pictures. He's he's not he's not showing any respect, you know. Mm. <laughs> and you know, my point is, I th I think we can be hypercritical. We can be we can see cases where people over criticise the minutiae of behaviour through the digital lens. But when we're dealing with putting life at risk, I, you know, and I think it's a very different kind of conversation. Mm. Andy, sorry, we, we, we cut you off in fouls, foul, <laughs> no, okay. foul manner. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, a couple of, couple of things, really. And I, I know we need to start drawing this to a close now. So I'll just, I'll just throw a few more thoughts out there. Um, one is that um, as we're recording, the Italian police are investigating the case of a, an English tourist who scratched his initials and those of his girlfriend on the date 23 for 2023 on a stone at the Colosseum in Rome. Now, again, that's a that's another site of, if you like, dark tourism. It was a place where probably thousands of people in the course of that building's active life died yeah. for the entertainment of others. Yeah. Um, well, actually, so and... just, just, I, I will come back to you immediately, but um, it's interesting. <laughs> I have a story about that. Uh, when I was lucky enough to visit Rome, I was there with my uh, Italian friend who's from L'Aquila. Uh, he's a, a medievalist. Um, and, we will have uh, our crosses to bear. We, we do. We do indeed. And he's, he's a lovely guy, though. Um, despite, yeah, poor guy. Uh, but anyway, we... we... <laughs> sorry, sorry, Hal. That was, that, that, that was a deliberate the satirical medievalist gig. I don't, I don't mean it at all. Make it. <laughs> don't make him go medieval on you, Andy. Don't make... Um, so... Uh, yeah, anyway, sorry, we were visiting um, Rome. We, we, it was a day out from L'Aquila, so we took the bus and, and went there. And um, uh, I went into the Colosseum, and there was this, they had, I don't know if it's always there, but certainly when I went there, they had this great big black cross somewhere in, in, the, uh, in the auditorium, um, sort of where the floor level would have been. And every now and then, a big, booming, ominous noise played. It was like a... Boing that kind of thing and uh, i didn't know what was going on my italian was awful uh, and i couldn't help because i was an idiot and also perhaps my age came into it comes into it as well when i went out there i got, got to the edge looked down into the pit where the floor would have been but and just went bring out the christians <laughs> in a city where obviously there's an awful lot of roman catholics we're not too far from the vatican itself and uh my friend um p pointed out to me very quickly that the awe and the cross were actually a memorial to christians who lost their lives at the Colosseum. he apparently in very quick order shouted out something in italian more or less along the lines of he's british it's okay he, <laughs> <laughs> he has no he um, has no sense of yeah, apartment. exactly. So the, the, yeah, yeah. We, can, we can fall foul of this stuff. Uh, and I think possibly age does come come into it. Anyway, Andy, back to you. Well, I, 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 yeah, well, thank you. No, I, I, I think just to, again, just to follow up on that, when mm. I, I, um, as you do on... Obviously, uh, I felt bad about I, it as well, I, I, by I, way, I should say. I, I did yeah. feel bad. <laughs> no, um, as you do when you have an, ar uh, an archaeological heritage-based Twitter account, other social media platforms are available, folks, including new ones. Um, but I, I tweeted out the story about the, the, the British to the English tourist and, um, somebody followed it up by posting the fo famous photograph of a Greek temple, um, uh, or at least a, 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 the wall of a Greek temple where the word Byron 
is scratched. Uh, as in Lord George Byron, the famous Hellenophile poet, mad, bad and dangerous to know mm -hmm. uh, from the 1820s. Uh, so you know this, this is this is nothing new. We're dealing with a, a, a basic human impulse, uh, you know. The, 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 you know, um, and 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 so, uh, and in that respect, you know, we've all got colleagues and follow colleagues who study. You know, there, there's a graffiti project on medieval churches hmm. that's underway at the moment. Um, you know, so th there's a, 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 a quite a narrow divide sometimes in you know do, do, do we say graffiti are banned in perpetuity because we're we're dealing with a quote heritage site okay it's not a it, it it's not a good thing generally you know to 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 damage a heritage site in fact it's downright illegal as our friend um in the coliseum is pro uh, in the process of finding out but at the same time um we're dealing with a human impulse the other well, thing i like i i'm, I'm, I'm um, i just want to in in in, in winding up i just I, i'm pleased how I mentioned mount everest um because i, I was going to raise that issue earlier um and again from a historian's point of view um one of the um holy grails of people who study the history of mountaineering is the camera that may be in the pocket of Sandy Irvin, mm. who was lost on Mount Everest in 20, 1924, along with George Mallory. George Mallory's body was found um, some uh, about, about 20 years ago, I think now, um, but without the camera, which could, may or may not prove whether they actually reached the summit of Everest, uh, you know, decades ahead of, uh, of, of Hillary and Tenzing. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that, 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 and, and if you like, that's, that's legitimate, research yeah in, 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 you know um and, and the final thing i would say is uh, uh, i'm talking about titanic and and, and again people who are interested in maritime histo history maritime archaeology is you know it's one of my specialisms will be very quick to point out uh that the titanic is far from unique as a site of disaster and mass loss of life hmm. um many shipwrecks um, that we deal with routinely as archaeologists um, or, or, or or try to manage have had similar loss of life. Uh, Gulf of St. Lawrence, the, the analogue that's often mentioned is the Empress of Ireland, where more people died than died on Titanic in sight of land. Um, but it's not so well known because it happened just weeks before the beginning of World War I. Yeah. And even more so, I, I, and uh, I... Um, I worked on a documentary last year about the German evacuations in the Baltics in 1945. And uh, the most famous example for people who know about it, uh, and it's very, it's famous in in Germany, it's Germany's Titanic, if you like, is um, a, a strength through joy liner called the Wilhelm Gusloff, which was torpedoed by a Russian uh, submarine while carrying evacuees hmm. uh, and German service personnel. Um, probably eight times as many people died on the Gustav as died on Titanic. Mm. It's estimated around 8,000 people. Mm. It's possibly the most, uh, the biggest loss of life in any Marine tragedy. It's a protected site now, but um, it, it's protected by Poland, whose waters it lies in. Um, it's been surveyed uh, non-intrusively, um, and it's been the subject of documentaries and feature films in, in German. Mm. Um, but it's hardly known in the English-speaking world. Yeah, uh, I suppose just to, uh, on the point of the mountaineering, um, I would highly recommend. There's an animated movie called The Summit of the Gods on Netflix, um, which is it's uh, anime. It's, it's in the Japanese anime style, but it's a very interesting um, story. It was a fictional story, but a story of mountaineers and what drives them. And actually, that that camera is a key plot point in that film. So that's uh, that's worth uh, watching uh, just for people at home. Um, also, as well, I suppose just one thought comes to mind based on what Howard was saying there. Um, in particular, this this notion or this question: Are we living in a time when we consider ourselves to be post-historical? In so much as 
for example, as Andy pointed out, the accumulation of graffiti is now seen as something which is an artificial infection of a site, a damaging of something which is historical, as opposed to something which is actually current and exists now that you can visit. I, I, and, I, I, hang on, Mark, I have to interrupt you. I, I, I'm not saying it's infecting a site. I, I think it's part of the no, no, no. I'm not uh, saying. I'm not saying the process of site formation. Yeah, I'm not saying. If you want to be you, technical I'm, about it. I'm not saying that you are. But what I'm saying is that the 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 the, the, the outrage is. Uh, is in the, the notion that this these things these sites are somehow preserved in aspic that that they're not eroding for example that's a natural process are we are, did, are we going to say that wind and rain shouldn't touch the Colosseum for example uh, is this an artificial notion that history uh, history is separate from our lives today um, or not in so much as you know clearly human curiosity is still as powerful as it ever wa was and the number the number of people in the nineteenth century uh, you know, what seventeenth century, you know, seventeenth century onwards, who who scratch their names on the Colosseum, is quite remarkable when you actually visit. There. Again, that's one of the things I did notice when I was there, when I wasn't insulting <laughs> Italian people. Um, so, what what do you what do you think of that? I mean, I'll, I'll give you hand over to you, Howard, and then to Andy, just to think. What what is there is there a sense of a, a problem in in terms of how we're encouraged to think about historical sites as simultaneously a place to visit? but also a place that somehow should be separate from our actual experience of being there. Uh, Howard? Well, I, I take on board what Andy says, that uh, graffiti is a complex, integral part of the story of popular sites that goes back millennia. But I mean, equally, Pompeii. I would say that in turn, as a heritage tourist or as a visitor, I've managed to go to almost every medieval church I visited. I've managed to resist... I have managed to resist carving my name on something. And, you know, most, you know, almost every English heritage site I've been to has not had my initials. But my point is, you know, it, it's not, it's, I think there's a, there's a danger of saying, oh, it's natural. And yeah. always, you can't but go there without, you know, cocking your leg and weeing like a dog on it or um, carving your name on it or throwing a custard pie at it. There's nothing natural about that. That in itself is a cult, is a, is a choice and a culturally embedded choice of when toffs went waltzed around the Mediterranean yeah. in the in the late eighteenth and early nineteenth century, carving their names on stuff. Mm. That is, that is a that is a historical phenomenon, but it's a very specific one to do with a particular class of people who have the privilege to do the that. Grand tour, well, yeah. Uh, and and you know, if if I saw, and I would say there should be, and rightly, if 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 um. If King Charles III visited the Colosseum and did the same, and went on social media, you know, there should be outrage in the same as it should be. So there is a class issue and who's entitled to do it. But I think in this issue, they managed a site, they've got the law, this person's bucking it, and so dumb, they put it on social media. I think they deserve all the outrage that's put at them because it can be made as an example that hopefully encourages others not to trash every site. But the number of hilltop sites where no one else is there, but mm. I find rubbish, I find detritus, I think, well, at one level, that's the story of the site. Mm. Uh, it's, it's not either or. One level, it's the story of the site. Another level, you know, you could have just put it in a bag. You know, you mm. didn't have to take your dog up there, put its poo in a little plastic bag, tie it up, and then sling it in a hawthorn tree for the next 10 years to be on display. You know, that was a choice to do that. That's not just ah, uh, the, 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 you know. So I think they're both, they're both things simultaneously. It's a story of, in that case, uh, dog walking and the, as a part of the biography of a landscape, a houndscape encounter, if you like. At another level, it's someone being a complete irresponsible git and not allowing people to appreciate that site without seeing their dogs plasticized remnants <laughs> you know and i think that's the kind of thing that we as archaeologists shouldn't be ashamed of holding in our minds at the same time that we are looking at something that is an ongoing biography of the site but it doesn't justify people being complete wreckers <laughs> no yeah no. I, 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 and, and for for the avoidance of doubt our viewer um I, i'm not advocating scrolling no, no, on sites at all no, um no. yeah i mean but, peeing, but, peeing on them is something else entirely you know that's yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't. I, I'm not going to go there. But, literally, uh, but um, look. I, it's okay, I, I, think, I, I, um, I, I would never tell. I would never tell on you, Andy. It's okay. Again, last couple of thoughts for me, I guess. Um, the, the the first one is that um, that instance of the English tourist who was scribbling at Pompeii. It went viral because somebody else 
the quality took mobile phone footage of the guy doing it and then mm. posted it on on youtube as i think it was uh, i can't remember, i think the title was something like our soul english tourist or something like that mm. so it was absolutely condemnatory of the behavior mm. and that's what that's how it came to go viral oh, right. and why the italian own family or to friend. i didn't realize that either way sorry yeah yeah um but so anyway, anyway that, 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 that's sort of by the by it's, it's interesting the way that 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 story developed in the modern social media world um heritage heritage protection by social media but um i think that the other point i'd make and again it's a very personal one but i think it's where we have a role as experts and educators and communicators um when I was about, I think I was about 11, and I was getting into history, and we were on holiday in Guernsey. And anybody that's been to the Channel Islands will know that there are many sites on the Channel Islands that are relics of the German occupation from 1940 to 1945, mm -hmm. um, including um, the only concentration camp on British soil on the island of Alderney. Now, I didn't visit that, but on Guernsey, there is uh, what's called the Underground Hospital, which we visited because it's open to the public. Um, now, I visited that site, as I said, at the age of 11. I knew what it was. I knew that it had been built by what would term slave labour, concentration camp labour. Mm-hmm. Um, and the information that you were given before you went in, um, and in the guidebook mentioned that it was hardly used and that one of the reasons it wasn't used very much was that actually the conditions inside the poor ventilation, temperature, whatever, it was not conducive to wounded service personnel recovering very well. Mm -hmm. Um, it's. If you like, now I would call it an example of dark tourism. At the age of 11, with that knowledge, walk into that site, into that space, with the knowledge of what it was and with the knowledge of how it had been built, even with a an 11-year-old's perception and an 11-year-old's you know, interest in military history and so on, it, in very short order... I found that was a space I didn't want to be in anymore. Mm. It felt oppressive. It felt like somewhere to understand, but to leave because it wasn't a good place to be. Mm. And I think that, you know, I was able to, I, I, I put that spin on it because the inf of the information that I've been fed as a visitor before going into that space. And it and, and and I had that you could call it respectful. You could call it on you know weird because it was you know forty years after the event. And what you know, it, 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 you know, but it was uh, that that experience has stayed with me for the rest of my life, and I'm mm. I'm recounting it to you now for the first time in public. Mm. But uh, I think it. I hope it has a relevance to what we've been talking about. Mm. I mean, that's the thing. We can't police behaviours and knowledge. What we can do is set up models and expectations and be balanced and reasonable. I um, mean, I do believe we should have an archaeology green cross code style set of short informational videos where me as role model stand in there. Like, Don't touch that, kids. You know, I think that should work. That belongs in a museum. Uh, with, a, with, a, with a trowel or something, sort of superhero style, or, yeah. you know, or sort of a Mr. T style. Don't do that, kids. You know, <laughs> but, but we also need the reality that you just say no isn't you know is, mm -hmm. is not is only perhaps not the only effective strategy of dealing with you know type these kind of behaviors but if i could encourage billionaires not to um to invest their money in something more meaningful i i would love to be able to do that because there are many heritage projects and many archaeological research projects that are much mm -hmm. more meaningful than trying to visit a site that's well known well researched and uh it should be left alone in my opinion yeah. well alone mm -hmm. Well, there you go, folks. Um, if you have the opportunity to visit the Titanic, at least we've given you some food for thought there. Um, certainly for our part, just want to reiterate that 
we we are not remotely making light of the, the tragedy that unfolded uh, surrounding Ocean Gate, and uh, hopefully, yeah, the, the these broader issues and also concerns from three heritage uh, professionals uh, might give you some some um, some broader prompts for your own thoughts as well again in, in that sense we're not looking to police anyone's actions but it definitely raised some questions and that's why we invited howard on uh, at such short notice so thank you so much for your time howard thank you thank you yes, thanks Alex. thank you thank you